so I'll try to wake you up with a bit of fresh air, um, bringing you to uh, northernmost areas compared to what you've been talking about those last days. Um, and also because as a geographer, my perspective is a little bit different. Um, basically, I when I heard that Lionel was organizing this uh, <laughs> this conference, I said to him, well, I'd love to say something about citizenship and native people because working with the Inuit, uh, it has become uh, some a topic of my attention. And, uh, and so Lionel was nice enough to say, well, you're welcome. So I might be a little bit um, on, uh, on a little bit on the it might be an offside kind of paper, but uh, I hope you will enjoy it. Also, it's more like, it's not a very structured paper. I have to apologize for that. It's more like thoughts that I've had on uh, on the topic. So this is basically, I put you, gave you a big map of the of the Arctic because you might not be very familiar with it. The Inuit um, live from uh, the eastern shores of Russia, Siberia, to Greenland. This is uh, their whole area there. And uh, in Canada, there are a number of communities where they have been, uh, where they settled down because the government made them to uh, be live in communities. Um, starting the Inuit were nomadic people in Canada until the late 40s in some areas and until the late 60s in others. So we're talking of, about a very late 1940s and 1970s, uh, 60s. So we're talking about a very different kind of uh, space time uh, than what you've been discussing. So we're there, it's, um, it's Christmas time in Uluqaqtoq and um, I'm there talking with uh, younger people that we've known each other already back in 1980 and I've been in the village for more than seven months at the time and um, it's early morning or late night we, I'm not sure and one of um, one of the persons one of the people being there Wayne Goose an Inuk aged 17 at the time suddenly asked the very difficult question and tell asks me so what do you think of us and I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> that's a tricky question. What can I answer? Um, I am not entitled to say anything. Uh, I don't, how, I, I cannot judge. Um, I'm not there for that. I have my own feelings. I'm not sure. Um, but I have to give an answer because um, you cannot be constantly uh, conversing with people and, and suddenly when comes a sort of personal question, not answering it. So my answer is like, well, uh, I think you're doing great. I'm a bit worried. I'm talking about a crowd of uh, people from 15 to 22, 23. Uh, and there's about 10 of us at the time. And I'm like, well, I'm sort of worried that uh, the, the language might be disappearing because we're in part of the Arctic uh, where the language is actually disappearing. Um, I, d I didn't say disappear. I sort of said I'm worried that you young people do not speak the language as much as uh, the elders and, and maybe some things are changing and I'm not sure. And then Diane uh, suddenly said, well, we're tired of being called natives. We want to be Canadian like everybody else. And this sort of stuck to my mind because I thought, wow, that's a very strong statement. And of course, I could have said, well, it's just, you know, teenager. Teenagers are never happy. They want to be something else. But I thought um, there was something more there. Also, because everyone sort of agreed with her everyone sort of no, no one discussed it and then we discussed something else or played card or whatever but I thought this is something f food for thoughts and it's and it has been with me for a very very long time also because in the Canadian context when you say that to some Quebecers they will just laugh at you and say <laughs> what's Canada you know Canadians doesn't even exist and 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 I remember very vividly when I said that at a conference and this 
Quebec professor said that, and I looked at him and I said, well, it might not mean anything to you, but to the people up there in the Arctic, it means something, and you should take it seriously. Because once again, we had some discrepancy be be between what some people think and others think, and they do not, and, and whatever Inuits say, it doesn't matter because us Quebecers, we know better and we have our own agenda. And this sort of made me angry. So uh, this being said, let's go back to a bit of history about the Canadian um, situation about citizenship. This is the map of the historical Indian treaties that were um, signed in Canada. And as you can see, the northernmost treaty was um, signed in 20 1921. It's treaty number 11. Treaties goes, go by numbers uh, in Canada. And uh, the map is actually wrong. It's always showed like that. But actually, Okay, um, the treaty was signed by the northern uh, Indians, the, the Dene people and the Gwich'in people, but not by the Inuit who live by the shores and uh, in the Mackenzie Delta. Because what happened in uh, 1929, the, the the Inuit living on the shores of the Beaufort Sea and in the Mackenzie Delta, um, had not signed a treaty because as the Inuit of the Eastern and Western Arctic, they were not legally defined as Indians. So when the treaties were being signed, they were not part of it. But in 1928, the Department of Interior and its administrative division of NWT and Yukon branch went to um, responsible for Inuit affairs, went to the Arctic in 1929, and uh, they reached Aklavik, which is the big, the big community uh, on the Delta. And uh, Finney, who was uh, the director of the NWT and Yukon branch, took time to meet with Inuvialuit, which are the Inuit of the region, to discuss matters of game regulations and other issues of interest to community leaders, including asking whether the Inuvialuit of the Mackenzie River Delta wished to sign a treaty. A man named Nulirak, whom the missionaries called, called Bob Cockney, of course, joined with his fellow in Nouvelle to listen to Finney's proposal. The proposal was $5 Canadian dollars a year payment, which was similar to what had been agreed with the Treaty Number 11 uh, by the Dini people. Um, so Nulirak recalls. Um, I told this to my fellow man, asked them what they thought about it, and they answered no, that you don't want it. So um, that is not enough. So I told them, I'll tell him that $5 was not enough. And I told so to the representative government. We feel that this is not enough and we do not accept it. The Inuvialuit wanted access to health care and food when times were hard. That was a time where there, were, there was some when hunting was bad or things like that, people could, would be starving at some point. So uh, they would help ask for um, food help. Uh, and so Finney promised we will act according to our wishes. What is important there to me is that back in 1929, the Inuvialuit felt strong enough to just say, no, we don't want your treaty because you're not treating us well. Uh, and uh, in the Arctic, in the northern regions, uh, the treaties did not include reserves. There's a reserve by the northern slake, slave lake, but um, northern, north of that, there's no reserves. But they just said, who do you think we are? You know, you're treating us with $5 a year. Are you kidding us? We don't want it. So this shows a lot of agency from the people there. And the reason they had the, this agency is because uh, whaling was had been very important in the late 19th, 18th century. And so uh, they had been in the Western Arctic, they had been um, acquainted with dealing with uh, whalers, with dealing with uh, traders, fur traders, whale traders, and economics were not something they did not understand at all. So they knew they were being ripped off if they signed this kind of treaty. But then... 
From the 1970s to 2006, the Inuit signed a number of land claim agreements with the Canadian government. So what happened between in 1929 saying no and in the 70s and especially specifically 80s, 19 and early 20s signing treaties? And this is a map of uh, the treaties, uh, the various tre uh, land claim agreements that were signed, which are not treaties, excuse me. We'll come back to this after, but I want to make a few points about what about citizenship. Now, the, in Canada, uh, there was no such thing as citizenship before the end of World War II. Uh, Canadians were subject of Her Majesty, uh, or His Majesty, and then Her Majesty, part of the British Empire. And in 1947, Canadian ship was created. Now, for the Inuit and Indians, uh, First Nations now, now uh, they were not given Canadian citizenship back in 47. It was only in 1956 that an amendment provided that anyone who was defined as Indian or Eskimos and who were not natural-born citizen, now that's interesting, but were domiciled in Canada on January 1st, 47, and had been resident in Canada for 10 years as at as of uh, January 57, 56, sorry, were granted citizenship, citizenship retroactive to January 1st, 47. So it's, it's an interesting sort of time thing because uh, by the time they were given citizenship, um, of course, there were relations everywhere in Canada, including in the Arctic, uh, but these people who were there and were born on that land were not considered natural-born citizens. And it was only um, about 10 years later that they were given citizenship or given or granted or recognized. I'm not sure which word we should use here. Now, we, if we look at voting rights, I would say it's even worse. Um, for provision, uh, provincial and territorial elections, uh, at various times after the Canadian Confederation, Confederation was uh, created in 1867, all provinces passed legislation that, in one way or another, disqualified status Indians from voting. Now, status, status Indians are Indians living on the reserves. And if you're living on the reserve and you're a status Indian, you have a number of uh, rights that um, are <laughs> into brackets, rights that are linked with the fact that you're a status Indian. If you're not living on the reserve or if you decide to... Um, you voluntarily renounce the, uh, to be a status Indian, then you lose any kind of specific right and you cannot be on the reserve anymore. So losing your, the status might not be very nice, but losing it is in a way much worse. So status Indians could not vote. After World War II, they were gradually being recognized voting rights in the provinces or the territories, but uh, the first ones were, surprisingly, British Columbia in 49, which was not very um, open to, uh, to native rights in various ways. But anyway, they were the first. And in Quebec, only in 1969. So that's a very interesting uh, timing. Federal elections now. Now, remember... From 47, they're citizens, but only in 46, they were recognized as citizens. Uh, Inuit were uh, officially qualified to vote in 1950, but because they lived in so remote areas, there were no ballot um, boxes in the community, so actually they could not vote. They, they were entitled to vote, but they could not. Um, until 60, 1962. And uh, for Indians, or First Nations, are they're called in Canada, it was in the, even worse because um, their vote for federal election, their rights of vote, was only uh, recognized in March 1960, which is very late. Okay, So you have to bear in mind all this regarding citizenship that is not something that was recognized for um, Inuit and First Nations in Canada for a very long time. Uh, but various things happened. Uh, there was, 
1974, uh, Canada commissioned Judge Berger to inquire on the view of the inhabitants of the Mackenzie Valley on a pipeline project that was uh, um, supposed to be built to bring already oil from the Beaufort Sea to uh, to southern Canada and the United States. The interesting thing about the commission was that the inquiry is that Berger was supposed to basically inquire uh, on environmental issues. But Judge Berger uh, took the time to travel to every community, even in the islands that are sh not shown on this map, and to listen, actually, to the people. And the final report that was um, published in 1977 was called Northern Frontier and Northern Homeland. And that was a cornerstone for recognizing the rights of the, uh, of the native inhabitants of the North as having a homeland. And it was also a cornerstone because for the first time in their communities, um, Dene people, Gwich'in people, and Inuit people would actually see someone coming and just say, I want to listen to what you have to say, and then publishing it. So it's a, it's a cornerstone in the history of a Canadian relationship with, uh, with the native people of Canada. This uh, was very important because uh, Canadian Indians and Canadian Inuit as well were also subject to um, the regime of residential schools that we've talked about earlier here. Um, for the Inuit, so for uh, the Indians, it started in the late um, 18th century up until the 1970s were the last ones that uh, were closed. For the Inuit, it lasted for a shorter time because their relation, their encounter with our um, white Canadian society came a little bit later. But still, it was a very traumatic experience. And um, about this experience, um, many things have been said, but I still want to say two or three things about it. First one is Jack Anawak, who's um, one of the leaders of the Inuit in, um, that was um, very important in uh, Inuit land claims in the 1970s and 1980s. And Jack Anawak went to residential schools and, ex and was one of um, the many um, unfortunate children that were not only culturally abused, language abused, but also physically and sexually abused. And Jack Anawak explained that he came from a very small community in the Central Arctic. And the problem was when the children were sent back home for the summer, uh, they could not say to tell their parents what was happening to them because they didn't have the words in Inuinaktun or in Inuktitut to, to, to tell their parents because basically um, they, many of them said that they had lost part of their, they went as small children, they would stay for one, two, three years at a, one time, they were not sent home every summer, and they were young, they were not uh, allowed to speak their own language, so they lost a lot of their language, and they came to their parents who had no idea what was going on. Uh, in Inuktitut, the idea of abuse is, um, of physical abuse is, is very foreign, and so they didn't have the words to say that. And plus, they were ashamed. Uh, another one, a friend of mine, Helen Memorana in the Western Arctic, told me just as recently as three years ago, and she was born in 1951, she went to residential schools, and she eventually was sitting there, and, and she said, well, I've been angry at my parents for a long time because they didn't want to hear. And her feeling was that uh, her parents, Parents, when her and her brother and elder sister uh, came back from residential school, her parents more or less knew something wrong was going on there, but they didn't want to hear because they were helpless. And uh, this feeling of helplessness made it that uh, you, it was something that could not be addressed within the families. So we have all this trauma. And then we have Jose Kusugak, who went to residential school himself and who said, we're first Canadians, but we're Canadians first. And um, 
he said, do Inuits see themselves as Inuit first or as Canadians first? I have always thought that those two sentiments were one and the same. After all, during our many meetings with Inuit from countries such as Denmark, United States of Russia, we have always been Canadian Inuit. So there is, despite all this trauma, there is an attachment to Canada and being Canadian, which is something that I've observed so many times in the Canadian Arctic. And so it brings me back to land claims. What do uh, people, what happens, what is going on with land claims? Because in the Arctic, you do not hear directly uh, discussed this idea of citizenship. What you hear about is land claims. And what what do you claim when you claim land claim? You claim, um, of course, you reclaim the land and the right to do whatever you want on your land. But you also claim the recognition of being there, of being the inhabitants, uh, the first inhabitant, first Canadians on this land. And uh, this is done through, this explains for, for other reasons too, but this is one of the many outcomes of the so many place name surveys that have been made in the ca in Canada since the er since the late 70s. This is a map that was drawn. I love this map. We have it actually here in um, at Passage because I was given a, uh, a I was given one in uh, in 1917, uh, where Margaret Pierce from uh, the University of Maine. Uh, made this map, which is only made, uh, which only shows um, native place names. And uh, for each area, she says where she got them from, got the permission from the native tribes or from the Inuit to actually map those place names on such an official, sort of official map. And the ones in the Western Arctic are ones that part Part of them, I recorded them when I was doing my PhD. So seeing this map is like, it's a huge statement of the land is ours. We were always there. And this is where, why we're citizens of this land. And um, this is just a close up because um, the place names tell the place names tell the story of what people have been doing here. Uh, you, re you referred to this uh, issue we made about spatial justice and indigenous peoples. And um, when we did that um, a few years back, and it's a bilingual publication, my I hypothesis was that, okay, we're native people, uh, indigenous peoples are claiming the land, but what are they claiming? The land is so important, and I am not saying it's not, an issue in itself, but is there something more? And um, the more that is behind it, I believe, is citizenship. Because you cannot have citizenship if you do not are recognized, if you are not recognized as the true inhabitants of this land. And if you want to, um, through land claims, what you're gaining is um, the recognition as equals to anyone any other people living on this land as an equal citizen to uh, be part of what's going on in the country and be part of the political contemporary issues that are discussed in the country. And this is why uh, I believe uh, Inuit people recognize themselves in uh, what Josie Kusugak said. We're first Canadians but we're Canadians first, in the sense that it's not only that when we look at other Inuit, we think, oh, we're Canadian. It's also that we want to be part of this country. And so our main focus is on being Canadians. And this is the logo of the, um, the Inuit Kanatami, the Inuit of Canada. And if you look closely at it, it's a maple leaf that is in the middle. And uh, it, it tells you uh, that story. And uh, another one, another main uh, figure of um, Inuit land claims, um, Zibidi Nungak, tells the story of, he says, well, uh, you know, us, we were there before, and uh, we welcomed the white, white people the way you welcome uh, the one who marries your daughter in the family. You give him a good the good seat, you welcome that person because then he's going to be part of the family and he's going to work with you. 
and you're going to be so you have and, and it was it's a very interesting way of seeing thing because Zebedi Nungak sort of reverses uh, the relation of power saying no we welcomed you and it's because of us that you can be there it's not true but it's the narrative that we're going to tell because this is how we're going to do it and in this way uh, land claims and citizenship is just like um, are just like the two runners of what the Inuit see as a well-made sled. A sled has two runners, okay? And a well-made sled is um, a mean that will let you travel safely far, and that will make help you. Uh, may, uh, that will bring you back home safely. Also, thank you.